Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so as Nida mentioned, uh, today I'm actually not going to talk about primates. I'm sorry, you should be disappointed. I'm actually going to talk about the evolution of fish, uh, which is a project that I've been working on for the past five or six years since I came back to Paris at ENS uh, on a permanent researcher position. Um, and just to get started at the very, very high level, um, so the work I'm going to present today is, is comparative genomics. So how we can compare genomes between different species to understand how they work, how they evolve, how they change over time. But maybe not comparative genomics as you are usually used to seeing it. Uh, when we talk about comparative genomics, very frequently we think about evolution of the sequence. And by that, I mean evolution of the information content that the DNA carries. So mutations that are going to change genes or non-coding regions in a way that is going to change their function. And if you go like, this is a slide that actually I, I shamelessly stole from uh, the Human Genome Research Institute in the US, where they explain what comparative genomics is and they describe comparative genomics as the comparison of DNA sequences that you can do at different timescales. So, if you look at like deep evolution comparisons of DNA between different species, you can look at um, uh, sequences that are conserved between different species and find common features between these organisms. And you can also do this, uh, these comparisons of sequences at shorter evolutionary timescales to find genomic elements that are unique to each. That's not the type of comparative genomics I'm going to talk about today. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about the conservation, not of the content of the sequences, but of the structure of these sequences, how they are organized. And in fact, during evolution, uh, DNA is passed in a way that conserves more than the content of the DNA sequence. It also conserves how these sequences are organized relative to each other to a large degree. This is what we call synteny. Synteny is the conservation of the order of genomic markers, genes, if you want to call them that way, uh, during evolution. And this is a representation of genes across different species of fish, because we're going to talk about fish today. Um, and each of these little boxes of color, when they are the same color, they are orthologous genes, so essentially the same gene in different species. What you can see here is that the order of the genes between these different species remains quite conserved over time. There are differences. There are genes that don't exist in some species, genes that probably maybe move to a different place. But you can see that the order that the genes are organized relative to each other remains quite conserved. And this is a, a different representation of the same type of information where uh, here, instead of looking like really at the order of the gene at the high resolution level, we are looking at the organization of the chromosomes of these species. So that's a representation of the organization of chromosomes between primates. And here, for example, you have like each of these little boxes is a chromosome in human. Each of these is a chromosome in chimpanzee. And we basically have dots where these sequences are orthologous between the two species. And that what you can see is that basically these organized as a line along the diagonal because the chromosomes of humans and chimpanzees are basically largely collinear between the two species. If we look between human and gorilla, it's kind of the same. And as we move farther and farther away from human in terms of evolutionary distance, what we can see is that this organization of genomes remain to a degree conserved. We can still see those lines where we basically have large collinear regions between species. But this organization breaks down over time uh, and is reorganized by what we call chromosomal rearrangements. So these large scale mutational events that reorganize not necessarily the content of the DNA, but the order and how it is organized relative to each other in the genome. And that's actually an, in, an under-investigated type of mutational processes. Um, and it's particularly interesting to us because it's largely independent from the mutational processes that modify the sequence content. So it's largely independent from base mutations, from small in the, uh, indels. Um, and so it's a type of mutational process that we can also use to understand how genome evolve, but differently from your usual sequence alignments to understand how sequence changed. 
And so today I'm going to talk about how we can leverage the evolution of these genome structures to understand the phylogenetic relationships between species, how species relate to each other, uh, to illuminate some molecular processes of genome evolution. And if we have time at the end of the talk, I will give a small, uh, small peek uh, into a different project where we try to reconstruct the karyotypes and the chromosome of species that existed millions and millions of years ago and that we don't have any genomic information for. And feel free to interrupt me at any time, raise your hand, ask questions. If we don't have time to go over all of this, this is also fine and we can stop at any point. Uh, I would rather that you ask questions if you don't understand something instead of me running away for 45 minutes. Okay, and all of this work was done, as I said, at my previous lab uh, at ENS, uh, at the Institute of Biology of ENS, uh, with my former group here where I was a permanent researcher. But really, most of this work is the work of Elise Paré right here, uh, my former PhD student. You're going to see her name very frequently on this presentation uh, because she did most of the work here. And this work was done in, in collaboration with the Genofish Consortium, uh, which is a French, Swiss, US consortium on, as you may have guessed from the name, genomes of fish uh, to understand the evolution of fish genomes. So we're going to talk about fish today, uh, and we're specifically going to talk about teleosts, which are basically most fish. When you think of a fish, you probably think of a teleost. They're an interesting group of vertebrates because they represent actually half of all known vertebrates. They are one of the most species rich groups of vertebrates. There's um, over 25,000 species of documented fish, uh, teleost fish. And they're also widely used in research as model organisms. So you're probably familiar with the zebrafish. Uh, it's very, very highly used for developmental biology, neuroscience, as a model for human disorders. Uh, you've maybe also heard of the killifish, which uh, is an emerging model, especially for um, aging and lifespan questions, and cichlids, uh, which are very widely used as a model of an evolutionary radiation that is pretty recent due to adaptation to new ecological niches and also used for studies for introgression or sexual selection. So there's a lot of research happening on teleost uh, fish. And what, something that makes fish kind of a complicated model is that they are actually ancient polyploids. Um, they went through a number of rounds of what we call whole genome duplications, where the genome completely duplicates and goes from like a normal diploid genome, as you think of it, to a genome that actually has four chromosomes of each type. And this happened several times during the evolution of vertebrates. It's a fairly common evolutionary process although not so much in animals. So there are two well-documented instances of whole genome duplication that occurred very early during the evolution of vertebrates right here, called the 1R and the 2R. These we share with teleost fishes. So we are actually very ancient octoploids. Uh, we are like tetrapods and humans, we are right here. So we descend from these events. But teleost fish actually went through a third round of whole genome duplication more recently, um, although not all that recently because this event is dated about 300 million years ago. So it's still a very ancient duplication event. And all of the teleosts descend from this whole genome duplication event. And it is thought that this duplication of the genome was actually one of the mechanisms that drove the evolutionary success of this clade by providing new genomic sequences that could be evolved, adapted, and, um, and lead to innovations in this clade. Ah, where are we getting? So what happens when you have a whole genome duplication? So this is a representation of like a small part of a chromosome in the non-duplicated ancestor where each box is a gene. And that's the haploid genome, like just one copy of a chromosome. During the whole genome duplication, each chromosome gets duplicated into two copies. So you have a lot of sequence redundancy in those duplicated genome. Uh, each gene is basically present in two copies where it was present only in one before. It is believed that this presents a very significant challenge to meiosis, 
uh, because instead of having like your diploid chromosomes pairing nicely during meiosis to produce gametes, now you have full chromosomes and that leads to what we call tetravalent pairing during meiosis. So lots of complications during meiosis to make sure that your chromosomes pair properly. And so for a very long time, it was thought that this challenge was very significant and that these duplicated species were kind of unstable and had to go back to a diploid state quite quickly to survive. And this is a process that is called rediploidization, where basically the two duplicated chromosomes are going to diverge and to become more and more different from each other. And this happens in part by loss of genes. So genes are going to be retained on one copy of the chromosome or the other, but not typically on both of them, uh, largely because of, of drift and uh, mechanisms of, of sequence loss. This process typically happens at the same time as diversification of the species. Uh, one, because it's a process that takes a bit of time, so evolution continues to happen during that time. And also it's believed that uh, rediploidization to a degree contributes to radiations, because if you have some um, non-consistent losses that happen in a population, this can lead to isolation uh, after a certain amount of time. And so this rediploidization process uh, leads to a different species that can, in some cases, retain both copy of a gene, can retain the same copy of a gene on the same uh, reduplicated, uh, rediploidized chromosome, and in some cases can have like, this species will have kept this copy of the gene, this one will have kept this one, and this one as well. So you can have some, some differences in the gene contents and how they are retained during this process. And as a result, um, uh, on anciently polyploid genomes look kind of like this. This is a representation of the zebrafish genome. Each of the box is one of the chromosomes in the zebrafish. And each of the line in gray here uh, links two genes that we are pretty sure are duplicate genes from the whole genome duplication 300 million years ago. And what you can see is that you can still very clearly see that process of duplication in those genomes. Uh, for example, chromosome 16 here is clearly like an ancient duplicate of chromosome 19. They share like almost all of their paralogous gene with each other. In some cases, it's more complicated. We've had like from chromosome two, clearly is the result of a bunch of genomic rearrangements. It shares uh, duplicated genes with a bunch of different chromosomes across the zebrafish genome. And today about 25% of genes in those teleos genomes are duplicated genes that come from the whole genome duplication. So it's, it's a large fraction of their genomes. And so what we are interested in is, well, what happened right after this whole genome duplication? Uh, because this is not very well documented. This number of redundant genes that we get in these genomes after the whole genome duplication makes comparative genomics kind of complicated because you're dealing with lots of duplicated genes. Sometimes you have one gene per genome, but it's not the same copy from the duplication. And that makes understanding what happens right after the duplications quite challenging. And as you can see here, like for example, the first question we're going to talk about is that we know that there are three main taxons of teleosts that radiated after the whole genome duplication, the osteoglossomorph, the elopomorphs, and the clupeocephalans. I don't expect you to, remain, to retain those names, uh, but we don't really know who came first. We don't really understand the phylogenetic relationships between these different species. So that's the first question we're going to tackle. Uh, can we use the structure of genomes to understand this phylogenetic relationship between species? So as I said, we have these three groups of fish that radiated after the whole genome duplication. Uh, at least the three groups that are still existing, there probably were more of them, but some of them became extinct since. So one of them is what we will, for the purpose of the talk today, call the eels. Uh, so that's angla, moray eels, like all of these like long fishes. There's a second group that is called the bony tongues uh, because they have like calcification in their tongue, as the name suggests, um, which is a smaller group with just a number of representative species that are still ex uh, extant today. And then we have the clupeocephala, and that's like for the purposes of the talk today, most fishes. 
almost all of the fishes, you know, are pupillocephala, if not an eel or a bonny tongue. And so, as I said, we don't really know who came first, what was the, the relationships between these groups, because their genome history at this time point is so complicated. And there's really only three ways that you can group those different species uh, and that they could relate to each other. Either the bonny tongues are the basal group, the one that uh, diverged first, or the eels are the first group that diverged, or the bonny tongues and the eels are actually sister groups, and all the other fish are like the out group. And this question was not resolved because there's not a lot of information to use to actually understand the relationship between those groups. Uh, it's been an open question since at least the 70s, how the groups relate, because first, there's not a lot of information from morphology. Most of the, of the first studies on this question come from comparisons of fossils and comparisons of morphological characters between those species. There's not a lot of info here to group these uh, fish by relationships of, of, um, of relatedness. Um, there's a little bit that the, like one paper that groups the bonny tongues at the, at the out group, uh, one like seminal paper that puts the eels at the out group. Uh, and this is basically the, mo the topology that most people consider to be correct. So of course, now we do have sequences for quite a large number of fish. And so people have tried to do molecular phylogenies with this, aligning the genes, trying to resolve this question using DNA information. The problem is that different studies have come to different conclusions, depending on the genes that they considered and the species that they considered. So the question was really not resolved. Um, so to try to resolve this question, we, well, we started by generating resources, especially for the eels. The eels were the group that where we had at this time, no whole genome sequence for any of the representative species. We were working with transcriptome data and uh, smaller data sets of genes that had been sequenced. So we sequenced the genome of seven representative eels and, and elopomorphs in general. Um, as you can see, these are pretty big genomes, like they tend to be between one and two uh, gigabases. We obtained really good quality assemblies. I'm not going to run you through the statistics, but we got basically chromosomal assemblies of these fish genomes um, for all of these seven species. And so the first thing that we did is just like, well, now we have these good sequences for even these eel genomes. We have some bonny tongue genomes. We have a bunch of cupeocephala genomes. Can we make a phylogeny based on sequence like people have done before? So we collected about a thousand different genes that are in single copy across all of these genomes. So we have pretty good information that they may be one-to-one -one orthologs. And we aligned them and we calculated a tree between these different species to see what the relationships are. And we used Astro for those of you who are interested in this. And what we found is this tree that you can see right here. Uh, it has really, really high confidence, like we have very high posterior probabilities at all of the nodes of the tree. So the DNA is kind of confident about itself. Um, and surprisingly, we, we obtained basically this uh, third scenario that I was showing you that had never really been supported by any morphological evidence and wasn't really considered as a proper possible hypothesis for these branchings in the literature. So, and this, this grouping is basically that the eels and the bonny tongues, like these two smaller groups, are actually sister groups, and all of the other fish are the out group. So, that was interesting, but obviously, as I said, people have done this before, people have obtained this, uh, this topology before, and the question wasn't really resolved. So, what was happening right here is that just like we had one more phylogeny based on DNA, and people were just like, huh, we've been here before. Uh, was not very convinced that this is the right branching. So we said, okay, well, can we use other types of information that we have now that we have these full genomes of these species uh, to, to understand the relationship between those species? Can we use, for example, microsynteny? So this order of the genes in the genomes as a phylogenetic marker to find the relationships between these different species. 
So we identified 3,000 marker genes based on their copy number uh, and that we had good confidence were good orthologs between the different species. And we basically compared the orders of these markers across the different species that we had in the data set. And we looked for pairs of genes like these ones, where like this marker in red, the next marker that we considered is the gene in green. And as you can see, they are, the, they are adjacent in both of these species. So we would consider these to be a conserved adjacency. And, we, and like the blue and the purple would be the same, but the, the orange gene here, we would not consider as a conserved adjacency between those genomes. And so I'm showing you this for a pair of genome, but we can obviously do this for all of the genomes in our data set. And that gives us a measure of distance between these different genomes that is based on the order of their genes and not on the DNA sequence that these genes carry. And when we did this, once we had this uh, matrix distance, we could build a tree from this because it's, it's a distance matrix. And what we found was, again, this same topology that groups the bony tongs and the eels as the sister group and all the other fish as the out group. And again, we had like really, really good confidence in that node. We had like really high bootstrap. So that was becoming interesting because as far as I know, no one had used this kind of information before to reconstruct phylogenetic trees at this scale. But we were just like, well, can we go even one step further and use and now not just the micro conservation of the order of the gene, but like the large scale, large scale organization of the genome, again, as a phylogenetic marker. And here, so we used what we call the micro centeny approach. So the conservation of genome organization at the very large scale. And we looked for large conserved regions in the chromosomes that were adjacent to each other in different species. And again, we used this to, um, as a phylogenetic marker. So we checked how many of these adjacencies the genome share and uh, used it to construct a tree with a method that is called FICRA and that we didn't develop. Um, and this, uh, again, we obtained a tree uh, based on this conservation of these large blocks of chromosomes and their arrangement in these different genomes. And again, we group the bony tongue with the eels. Uh, and the other fish are the outgroup. So part is not as strong uh, with this analysis because we are working with a much smaller number of characters. We're working with a like, smaller number of blocks of chromosomes, so we don't have as much power. But what we had here is that at all of the levels that we were looking at, sequence conservation, gene organization, chromosomal organization, we consistently got the same information that the eels and the bony tongs are actually sister groups. Um, and that allowed us to, we think, pretty conclusively uh, resolve this, the history of these groups uh, at, after the whole genome duplication. Uh, as I showed before, like this was published in Science earlier this year. Um, not that people care that much about fish phylogeny, but mostly because these techniques to use uh, this genome organization is actually kind of new and possibly can be applied to other questions in the tree of life that we cannot resolve just based on sequence information, which there are still many from. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the second part of my talk where uh, we're going to see how we also used the genome structures in this fish to understand how the genome evolves at the molecular level after whole genome duplication. Um, so I'm back to my whole genome duplication right here. Um, and the second question we were interested in is how did that whole genome duplication happen? Like what, what happened at this time point that led to the genome being fully duplicated? And there's two main ways that whole genome duplications can occur. Uh, one of them, I will actually start with this one because it's simpler, uh, is what we call autopolyploids. It's basically you have like a single parent, something goes wrong usually during meiosis and you don't have separation of the chromosomes and you end up with a progeny that is tetraploid. Um, it's called autotetraploid because you have only a single parent that self-duplicates basically. But there is a second mechanism that is well documented, especially in plants, which is called allopolyploidy, which is actually a doubling of the genome through the hybridization of two different parents. 
So two different species that possibly come from a common ancestor some time ago, but have speci speciated, have diverged, have sometimes kind of significantly different genomes that will mate, hybridize, and result in a genome that somehow, instead of, of going back to like a diploid genome with one chromosome of each parent, would actually double as a mechanism of coping with these two different genomes in the same nucleus. And so you will obtain a tetraploid where you technically have four copies of each chromosome, but in some cases, these, these four copies are actually two by two copies, two coming from one parent, two coming from the other parent. This has kind of significantly different consequences for the duplicated genome, because in this case, you basically have two fully identical duplicated genomes that come from a single parent, if, if we ignore like the, the standing genetic variation in those genomes. Here, you can have subgenomes that are significantly diverged, even before they uh, get gathered again as a single species. That can lead to a bunch of mechanisms of subdominance where one of the genome will kind of take over and, for example, keep more genes during the redeploidization process or be more expressed. Or for, I know a lot of you are working on transposons. If these two guys have different transposons, it can, it can be mayhem. Like one of them can completely invade the other one with its transposons. So that can lead to all kinds of uh, evolutionary mechanisms in, in these genomes and which are not likely to happen when you have an autopolyploid. Uh, and as you may guess, I've talked about meiosis before, but meiosis is significantly simpler here uh, because these are already pretty much pairs of chromosomes that are less likely to form tetravalence during meiosis. While here, well, these were performing meiosis and so these can pair in any number of ways during meiosis. And we didn't know what type of mechanism has actually led to the duplication in fish. Uh, it was an open question as to whether it was an allopolyploid or an autopolyploid uh, with evidence for both that I will not really describe today because I don't have time. But um, And so to understand this, well, we what we did is just like, well, if we want to understand if this comes from like a single parent or two parents, we need to find the trace of these ancestral chromosomes. We need to find them again in the extant genomes and see if we can trace if they came from a single parent or from two different parents. So what we did is that we used uh, a previously published um, reconstruction of the ancestral genome of fish before the whole genome duplication. So our colleague, uh, Ethan Eliza, who also works on this problem, had previously determined that the the genome of the ancestor of fish probably had 13 chromosomes. So what we had to do is to say, well, okay, we had 13 chromosomes. After duplication, we have an A and a B copy of each chromosome. They may or may not be diverged. And can we trace where these chromosomes are in these different genomes? I'm not going to go into the details of the methods, uh, but basically we used um, we use sequence information and orthology information to trace the localization of those genes in each of these chromosomes back to the genomes, which led us to identify all of these regions that descend from each of these duplicated chromosomes. So we had a map for, I'm showing you three genomes here, but we actually had 74 different fish genomes that we could paint in this way with the chromosome of origin of each of their region from the whole genome duplication uh, and differentiating between the A and the B pair for each of the, um, for each of the ancestral chromosomes. And we use this, uh, this information is, is useful to us because once you pair these, these regions that are duplicated and come from the same ancestral chromosome initially, you can start looking at regions that have differences in evolution in the two regions or that follow some odd patterns of evolution. And what I mean by odd patterns of evolution is, well, for example, genes where the, the information that you get from the sequence of the genes looks, looks kind of odd. So this is an example of a region that comes from the ancestral chromosome three uh, before the ancestral duplication. Spotted guy is an odd group. It's, an, it's a fish, but it's not teleost. It doesn't have a duplicated genome. So this ancestral chromosome corresponds to still one chromosomal region uh, in the guard. Uh, 
Zebrafish, Tickleback, and Medaka are teleost. They are duplicated, so they have two regions on two different chromosomes that come from this ancestral chromosome 3. And here, like, you have a gene across all of the different species. Like, this gene was duplicated during the whole genome duplication and has been retained in all of these species. And when we take the sequences of these genes and, and we align them and we make a tree, we obtain a tree that looks like this. And it's exactly what you would expect. Like the blue copies all come from chromosomes that we think are the same copy descended from the same uh, ancestral chromosome. Same for the green ones. However, we also get genes like this one, where when we align the sequences and we build a tree from the sequence, we get a tree that clearly is not correct based on what we know from the evolution of these genomes. So the tree based on the sequences tells us that the blue genes are orthologous and the green genes are orthologous. But when we look at this, it's pretty clear that the blue gene in zebrafish is, is actually orthologous, well, is orthologous to these genes right here. Like, because it comes from this ancestral chromosome. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty clear that the tree the sequence tree that we obtain is wrong. We also get situations like this where, well, the sequence tree tells us that the duplication is actually recent and is not doesn't come from the whole genome duplication because there's only one gene in zebrafish. When we look at the structure of these chromosomes, it's pretty clear that zebrafish had a gene copy here at some point and it lost it. So it, what I'm trying to get at is that having the structure of these duplicated chromosomes gives you some information that you can't get just from the gene sequences in terms of when the gene trees especially are wrong. And in some cases, these gene trees are wrong just because we don't have enough information content in the gene sequences. So we align them, we build a tree, but this tree is not super well supported and it's incorrect just because there is something weird in the sequences. But in some cases, and very repeatedly in this analysis, what we found is that we actually found two tree topologies in our data set of gene trees that were not random. If, if this was an, an error due to like, we don't just don't have enough information in the gene sequences to build a tree that is reliable, you should get all kinds of different errors. But in that case, we were getting two tree topologies uh, very repeatedly. This one is exactly what you would expect from the whole genome duplication. Like you have only a small representation of species here, but what you can see is that all of these species that are teleosts that come after the whole genome duplication, the copy A of the genes group together, the copy B of the gene group together. So basically gene duplicated here and you have one copy here, one copy here. Exactly what you would expect after a duplication of a gene. But we also had a large number of genes that fold this topology of, of gene sequences where the two copies that come from, that's the bony tongs that I were talking about earlier, all groups together, the A and the B copy, and all of the clupeocephalus of the other genes of the genomes also group together A and B copy. And that actually looks like what you would expect if you had two independent duplications here and here, right? So, but we know from the chromosomal structure that these genes come to, from, the, from the whole genome duplication. So we have this inconsistency between what we know from the chromosomes and what the sequence is telling us, which is that the duplication is actually more recent and is two different duplications in these two groups. We call these sequence and synteny conflicts. Um, and yeah, the, the structure of this tree in this case suggests that the duplication is younger. And we found these, like we found a lot of these. Uh, it, clearly, it wasn't just an error of aligning the genes or the way we compute the traits. So we looked at where they were uh, and whether they were randomly distributed in the genome. And we found that it wasn't the case. These, these conflicts between the information we get from the chromosome organization and from the gene sequences were largely concentrated on three, chrom three ancestral chromosomes. The pair of chromosomes that come from chromosome three, the pair that come from chromosome 10 and from chromosome 11. Again, not the pattern that you would expect randomly if like these were errors. And so that was kind of exciting because, and well, yeah, when you look at the genome of the Medaka today, you can still see like they are the pairs in orange here. You can still, for example, like they concentrate in some very localized region of the Medaka genome. Like it's it's not a random representation across the across the genome. Uh, 
So how can we explain this? I'm going to try to walk through this quite quite slowly because it's it, it requires a little bit of, of mental gymnastics. So this is how I describe to you what rediplodization happens during the evolution and the way we typically think of genome duplications and gene duplications. You have a chromosome in your ancestor with genes on it. This chromosome gets duplicated. At the beginning, it's it can be identical. It can be like somewhat divergent if they come from different parents, but you basically have two copies of the genome. And then these two copies are going to go through this redeploidization process where the two copies are going to diverge. They're going to lose some genes on some of uh, the, the two copies when they are retained are going to diverge in sequence. And then you have speciation and this process continues in the different species. And so the gene tree that you obtain in this case is that the blue genes that come from this chromosome look similar between species one and species two. The green genes look similar between species one and species two because basically they started diverging right here before the species separated. So you find the duplication where you expect it. That's what happens if rediploidization happens quite early. But what can also happen is that rediploidization can take a very long time and you can have situations where like this part of the chromosome got duplicated some process as earlier, but it's actually going to stay very similar for a long time. So long that actually speciation can occur before these sequences have really started diverging, especially if meiosis keeps pairing these chromosomes together uh, and keeps them exchanging material during meiosis. And in that case, if the redeploidization process occurs after the speciation, it will happen independently in the two different species. And so these, these gene sequences are actually going to start diverging at this point and at this point. And that gives you exactly the tree structure that I was talking about earlier. The genes duplicated here, but they started diverging in sequence later. And so they group by species instead of grouping by gene copy. Does that make sense? Thank you. <laughs> it's the first time anyone is getting this on the first try, so. Good job. <laughs> so yeah, so what we think happened is that actually in those regions, meiosis was still mixing these chromosomes together, like these, these two, these, these pairs of ancestral chromosomes were still getting mixed and remixed during meiosis at the time that the different clades of fish started diverging. And so that allowed us to, to time when the meiotic recombination kind of stopped during the evolution of fish. And that was at least 60 million years after the whole genome duplication. So for 60 million years, this duplicated genome kept doing meiosis between its four chromosomes in some places and had absolutely no problem, <laughs> which I personally find is, is kind of mind blowing. But <laughs> and a second consequence of this information is that for meiotic recombination to occur in this way, you have to have very similar sequences to begin with. And that tells us that, well, the ancestor of teleost was probably what we call an autopolyploid. So it was a single genome that got duplicated. And because it got duplicated, it was able to maintain this meiosis in some places for a very, very long time. Okay, so some take home messages. Um, the first one is that as I hope I've shown you, we can actually use genome, uh, genome structure as a complement to sequence um, to resolve questions of phylogeny um, that we cannot really answer with sequence alone. Like it can be used as a phylogenetic character to explain the, phylo the phylogenetic relationship between species um, largely, that's because this genome structure evolves from mechanisms that are largely independent from the mechanisms of mutations that change the content of the DNA sequence. So it's, it's complementary and could be used uh, to, to answer sometimes these questions in a different way. And exploring these ancestral genome structure can actually reveal evolutionary events that are extremely ancient, because as I said, the whole genome duplication was 300 million years ago. It can even reveal in some cases what was happening at the level of the cells. Like here we are seeing the traces of meiosis occurring 300 million years ago that still leaves traces in the evolution of the genomes today, which is uh, 
I think, interesting. Okay. Um, do you want me to move to the next part or do you want us to go for questions? Okay, so I can go on a little bit. I'm just going to make this quite quick, uh, just to give you a small uh, look into a project that has been ongoing in my previous lab at ENS for at least 10 years, <laughs> um, to reconstruct the genomes of very long lost ancestors uh, and the, their genome structures. So the idea behind this project is that to, to really leverage this um, evolution of genome structures to do large scale evolutionary analysis, you need to be able to reconstruct how the genome changes over time on a tree, like you would for sequence, right? It's, it's not a new problem. Uh, people have been working on this for at least 20 years. Um, and there's been a lot of different advances to reconstruct these ancestral genomes at different nodes of the phylogeny. I don't have time to give you the full overview of the background, but we were by no means the first ones to work on this. Um, However, uh, Mathieu Mufato right here, um, and uh, with help from Alexandra Louis and, and Enga Nguyen, developed an algorithm that we call Agora, uh, for algorithm for gene order reconstruction in ancestors. What this algorithm does, that is going to automatically reconstruct the karyotype, the gene order and the karyotype of these ancestral species in the tree, based on the information that you have from extant species. So it's going to take the reference genomes from extant species and use them to reconstruct what their ancestors looked like, including for very, very old ancestors in their evolution. Uh, and this work was again published very early this year in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, for example, we reconstituted, we reconstituted the, the karyotype of the amniota ancestor. The amniota ancestor is, is right here, it's number five on my picture. It's about 300 million years ago as well. So it's, it's like very old. It's the ancestor to all mammals, to all birds, to all reptiles. It's like old dinosaurs, all of them. Um, and so we have a reconstitution of this, of the karyotype of this species. We think it had a very large number of chromosomes and that it had what we see in birds today that are called microchromosomes. So these very small chromosomes that have a very high GC content. And because we, so once we reconstruct this ancestor, we can then trace the evolution of these different chromosomes along the evolution of the tree. So for example, this is the karyotype that we reconstruct for Boreotheria, which is right here, number four, the ancestor to most of the mammals that you know. And so we can trace the, like where each of these blocks of chromosomes, how they were rearranged and reorganized in that genome. But we can also zoom in and actually look, this is so a much higher resolution representation that looks like what I showed you earlier. Each of the dots here is actually a gene. So we can really go and look at how the gene order has changed from an ancestor to the next and to a, a, a more recent species. That's like the same idea. We can take a chromosome, trace it all the way from amniota all the way to human and see how it has rearranged. And we can do this at the whole karyotype level. This is the example of going from amniota to mouse. OK, so just to give you an idea of how that works, um, the, as I said, these reconstructions are based on comparisons between extant species for which we have the genomes and we have the organization of the chromosomes. The way it works at the higher level is that we're going to compare, like if we want to reconstruct this ancestor here, Boreotheria, we're going to compare any two pairs of species where Boreotheria is somewhere along the pathways between the species. The reasoning is that anything that exists in lizard and also exists in opossum must have existed in Boreotheria because it's on the path between these two species. So it must have been inherited. And so we do this for pairs of representative species. In that case, for example, human and mouse are not useful to reconstruct this ancestor because they are more closely related. So anything that we see between these two could be a more derived character. And so we compare the order of the genes. We use the genes as the anchors of this analysis. And we check like pairs of genes that are in the same order and in the same orientation between these different species, like, and we just collect them in the pairwise manner across all of the possible comparisons. 
we get this information of pairs of genes. And then from this, we actually build a graph where each node is a gene. And each edge is a link between two genes that have been seen neighbors and in the same orientation in at least one of these pairwise informative comparisons. These graphs are weighted. So the more frequently we see these genes in an informative comparison, the higher the weight is going to be on the edge. And if everything was perfect and evolution was never convergent and genomes were perfectly assembled and everything, you would expect these to just give you like the order of the genes in the ancestor, right? Because if you have sufficient information, it should be completely consistent and it should work. In effect, what we get is graphs that actually have some cycles in some places. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this. This is largely due to the annotation of the genomes, not to their evolution. Um, and we linearize this graph by taking the edges that have the higher weight. And if you have sufficient information, that should give you the gene order all the way to the chromosome. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. We do this recursively in different ways, using different sets of markers at different scales, which kind of amounts to what would happen if you were scaffolding a genome um, that you had recently sequenced. And that gives us information on uh, that can go all the way to chromosomes and karyotypes for most genomes. Um, at least in, in vertebrates and in plants, most genomes that are younger than 100 million years, we can reconstruct to the karyotype level. And we did it very extensively on several databases. So I'm giving you like a representation of uh, the speed of evolution of the chromosome structure that we infer from these comparisons across all of these different um, vertebrates. Uh, and what you can see here is that First thing that we see is that the speed of evolution of these genome structures changes quite rapidly. Here, the length of the branches is what we call intrachromosomal rearrangements. So basically inversions that occur within chromosomes but don't change the general karyotype. And in color, you have the interchromosomal rearrangements. So the ones that actually change the structure of your karyotype by exchanging material between different chromosomes. And we see some, some interesting observations. For example, here we have a very like bright branch in, in the rodents that goes from, like that takes you between the, um, towards the Muridae ancestor. This was known, it's known that this branch is very fastly evolving and that the cryotype has been very rearranged in this part of the tree. We can also see that like this uh, specific white mouse, the shrew mouse um, also has a lot of rearrangements. We can see also, for example, that the dog has a lot of rearrangements. This is also known. This is partly due to um, the domestication process. And we can see that we have some variations. Like, for example, we have, we have some branches that are extremely long. For example, the sole here, uh, which is a fish, uh, has a very, very, like, I think the longest branch that we can create in this entire tree because it has, it, it has a very stable karyotype, like it has almost no interchromosomal rearrangement in all that time of evolution, but it has a lot of inversions in its genome. So that allows us to estimate this dynamics of interchromosomal and interchromosomal rearrangements and to see how these genomes change. And you may ask, how, how is that useful? Like, what can you learn from this? So this representation is, is basically the same data as here. It's like all of these rearrangements that we calculate over all of this entire tree mapped onto the human genome. And basically what we're looking at here is like, if you were to project what amounts to almost 4.5 billion years of cumulated evolution on the human genome, where would rearrangements concentrate? And what we find that we have regions that have no, no, or almost no rearrangement in all of that time of evolution. And we have regions that have a very high density of breakpoints, uh, which are the regions in red. And when we look at what these regions are, that when it gets kind of interesting. So the regions that are very stable, that basically never rearranged, are very highly enriched in developmental processes. This was known before. Like we know that regions that are important for development don't rearrange. That's probably because these genes have very tightly regulated processes of expression with uh, regulatory elements around them that can't be separated from their genes. 
otherwise development fails or, or goes wrong. However, what wasn't really known is that when you look at regions that concentrate a lot of rearrangement breakpoints, these are very highly enriched in immune genes. And we know that immune genes tend to be the fastest evolving in the human genome at the sequence level. We know that they tend to be under positive selection because you need to, you need to adapt against those pathogens. What we show here is that they don't just adapt at the sequence level. These regions also rearrange all the time during evolution. And probably some of these rearrangements are selective, although we can't really pinpoint which one at this point. OK, and that's it for me today. Uh, I want to thank everyone in uh, my previous lab, the Degelgen lab at ENS, uh, especially Hugues right here, uh, my former group leader, Alexandra, uh, and obviously Elise, as you can see, like she signed as a first author most of these papers, uh, and she did a fantastic job. All of our colleagues on the Genofish Consortium, and I also want to give a shout out to my new team at Institut Pasteur. We don't work on this anymore. We work on something completely different. We work on the evolution of the uterus and the evolution of menstruation. Uh, we work on how the, the uterine lining basically acquired these incredible process of breaking down and regenerating every month, uh, which is something that appeared convergently several times in the evolution of mammals. So we try to understand how that works uh, at the transcriptomic and evolutionary levels. And I'm done with my talk. I will take any questions. <laughs>